welcome to episode 183 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. We have a thank you straight off the bat. Yes, we want to thank Christy, who is our newest patron supporter. Thank you so much, Christy. And speaking of Patreon, our book giveaway this month is The Memory of Animals by Claire Fuller. To be eligible to win this book, you need to be a Patreon by June 15th. And this book is out the day this episode airs, which is June 6th. Nice. And you know what? We want to thank everybody, too, who's made purchases through our bookshop.org page. We really appreciate that as well. Yeah, we're an affiliate of bookshop.org. They are competing with some of the big guns and sharing a percentage of the proceeds with independent bookstores and with affiliates like us. Yeah, so thank you for that. Emily, what are you currently reading? I am listening to two audiobooks at the same time, which is kind of funny Ooh, for me. Yeah, different. Yeah, and I think part of why it's working, they're both essay collections. So one is Tiny Beautiful Things, Advice from Sugar by Cheryl Strayed. This is the 10th anniversary edition. On episode 80, I talked about how I binged the Hulu show that's based on this book of essays, Tiny Beautiful Things. I had heard that there was a new anniversary edition, but I didn't know if there was an audiobook version of it. And there is. So it has a new preface and then six new responses that she has to people who send in these letters looking for advice. And I love it. It's poignant. It makes me cry. And it would be a great graduation gift if people are looking for something like that. But I think the other book that I'm listening to is a great foil, which is Quietly Hostile by Samantha Irby. Oh, my God. That's a great title. (laughs) And it has this skunk with its tail sticking straight up, you know, like it's about to spray with its teeth bared. She is just irreverent and talks about some of the funniest things. I was laughing so hard on my drive over to Book Cougars HQ this morning, and then a friend called in the middle of all that. So I had to explain why I was laughing hysterically. I mean, she's talking about everything from having to put on regular clothes again after the pandemic to adopting a very unadoptable dog and starting to take it to doggy daycare and what that experience is like. And then how she reacts to people. You know, those people in your life who want to offer you advice that you don't really want. Sometimes it's even advice after you've done something like you may have renovated your bathroom and then they come in and they're like, did you ever consider (laughs) moving the bathtub? And so her response to that is she'll just say, I like it. They're like, why would you wear stretch pants out to dinner? I like it. And I'm giving you very small examples, but she's hilarious. If you are wanting a good laugh, kind of in the vein of someone like David Sedaris, but for me, a little bit more accessible things that she's talking about in her life, highly recommend. So again, these are two audiobooks, Tiny Beautiful Things, Advice from Dear Sugar, narrated by Cheryl Strayed, and Quietly Hostile by Samantha Irby, also narrated by Samantha Irby. (laughs) Well, I'm reading Outlander still, the third one, Voyager. I'm approaching the 90% mark. This is the first one that I've noticed there are significant differences from the adaptation that was done, the miniseries some things are very different. And I can almost see why they changed it. Because it does film better, probably, than some of the lengthy conversations. They're on a ship a lot, different ships and things like that. And I can imagine that would have been hard to film. And I'm doing that with my ebook. That's my bedtime book. So it's not like I'm spending a lot of time reading it a few minutes before bed. Yeah, but you're getting through it. Do you think you'll keep going? Or is it too soon to ask that question? Oh, yeah, I'll keep going. Okay. (laughs) I'm not sure when I'll start. But I know I'll miss the characters once I haven't been reading it for a little bit. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad that's fun. Diana Gabaldon, Outlander. 
I'm also reading Devil in the Grove, Thurgood Marshall, The Groveland Boys, and The Dawn of a New America. This is my big summer reading book sponsored by our friend Sue Jackson. We did a video over on our booktube channel if you want to check it out about the our books that we're reading this summer. These are books that are 400 pages or more. Thurgood Marshall was a Supreme Court justice in the United States. But this book is more about his time before he became a Supreme Court justice when he was working on a case down in Florida. I started it over the weekend. I'm only 60 pages in. It's very dense, excellent writing, lots of history. So I have to stop quite often and look things up, which I'm really enjoying. Each of the chapters starts with a photograph from archives that Gilbert King was looking at. And the part that I'm reading is when Thurgood Marshall is a lawyer for the NAACP. And so the book starts in his early years as a lawyer and his early years in New York City. I thought I would read just this little passage because this is the type of history that's also a part of the book that I'm finding really fascinating. After the Civil War, many black soldiers, not content to be swept into the undesirable parts of a town, chose to settle in one of dozens of race colonies that had begun to spring up across the nation. There, blacks could live a life that was virtually free of racial friction. In 1887, Eatonville became the first incorporated African-American community in America. According to its most famous resident, the writer Zora Neale Hurston, who gained fame during the Harlem Renaissance, Eatonville was something of an oasis for blacks. In 1949, after traveling the world and after decades in New York, where she'd moved in the same Harlem circles as Thurgood Marshall, Hurston had returned home after being falsely accused of molesting a 10-year-old boy. The charges were ultimately dropped, but the damage to Hurston's reputation was irreparable. And unable to make a living with her pen, the talented, outspoken, and now broke Eatonville resident was working as a housemaid in Florida. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That is. I wonder if that was like a setup or something. Yeah, I don't know that part. And I haven't looked that up. But that's an example of the kind of history that I've been coming across as I read the book. And Thurgood Marshall you know, he was part of many circles, you know, he lived in Harlem, in the beginning chapters, he's traveling a lot to the South to try these cases. And they talk about how tired he is, and exhausted, and has some health problems because of that. And then also how dangerous it is for him to be going into the South and trying these cases. And there are people who are waiting for him to arrive. So they come up with this underground way of communicating of how they're going to hide him and places he's going to stay so that other people can try to keep him safe. Mm. And there was one really butt clenching scene where he won a case and then the police followed him and his fellow lawyers. And really it was a setup to try to get him cornered and they were planning to lynch him Mm. and he ended up getting away. That reminded me of when I read the novel Moonrise over New Jessup by Jamila Minix. And that book took place in 1957. And it took place in New Jessup, Alabama, which was a town that rejected integration. So it reminded me of the town that Zora Neale Hurston was living in, although it was a novel. And I should say that Devil in the Grove is in the late 40s, the part that I'm reading now, I think it's 49. And I'm only 60 pages in. Wow. Yeah. So I'm really enjoying it. If um, you're interested in history, this would definitely be a good book for you. And I'm not usually interested in certain kinds of history that are like a lot of dates and things like that. But when you can put history in context, like this book is doing, I love it. Again, it's called Devil in the Grove. It's my big book read. And I am really enjoying it. If you want to read along with me, we have Buddy Reads on the Goodreads group page. Very cool. Well, I'll talk about my big book that I'm currently reading, which is Ulysses by James Joyce. And uh, my Goodreads thread for this book, I created a schedule, which at the time seemed manageable when I was just flipping through the book, looking for breaks and things like that. 
wow, it was completely unrealistic to try that type of schedule. Ulysses is one of those books that you hear is hard to read. And I always associated that with being hard to understand because it's a lot of stream of consciousness things. And there are guidebooks, supplementary books to help people understand the book. I didn't want to read it with those this first time through. You know, some of the advice I'd heard is just read it the first time through. Don't worry about understanding and figuring things out. Just read it through the first time, which is advice for any challenging text, even textbooks. They say just read it through and then go back. Well, it's not just that it's not understandable. It's just very dense and it's not a quick read because I do want to read each word. I've been tempted here and there to skip over a paragraph, but I, I've caught myself and I'm not doing that. But it doesn't make sense when you're reading it because you don't know the context and it's somebody else's thoughts. So in some of the scenes like that, I'm trying to imagine that I am this person walking down the street doing whatever, right? But the schedule that I made is completely not doable unless you have nothing else to do for the whole day than sit and read X amount of pages. So I think my new strategy for reading Ulysses is going to be maybe just reading it an hour a day and getting through it that way. Because I'm not tempted to throw in the towel on the book itself, because I am finding it very interesting. Britta made a comment. She's a booktuber. If you're not familiar with her, check out her channel. She made a comment on the Goodreads thread that it's more interesting than enjoyable, mm. which I agree with, because it is interesting. And it is a bit of a snapshot in time. 1922 is when this book was published. And it is the day in the life of a character who's walking around Dublin. Hmm. So so it all takes place in the course of one day. One day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So more to come on that. And if you want to join in the read along or pipe in with that discussion, you are more than welcome to. Yeah, And check the show notes. I will put the links in the show notes for both of our books. Yeah. You know, and I have a question, too, if somebody knows the answer to this. When I was reading Sylvia Beach's memoir of Shakespeare and Company, and she was the first publisher of this novel, which had been serialized in the little review, but she was the first to publish it in novel form. Joyce really wanted the cover to be blue, the specific blue on the Greek flag, because he modeled this after the Odyssey by Homer, and he wanted that Greek color, the blue. But the book that I have in my hands is green, which when I first saw it, I thought, well, that makes sense. Irish, green. But his intention was to have a blue cover. So I'm wondering when things changed, or if the issue of the cover is just one of those things from literary history that has been forgotten. Right. But if yeah. anybody knows details about the color and the covers and stuff. I mean, there are other covers too, as well for this book. It's been published many times with different covers. So that's Ulysses by James Joyce. All right, Emily. So what have you just read? Well, since my big project is slowly coming to a close, I've been picking up some of the books that were languishing around my house. And one of them is Fieldwork by Elena Reagan. And this is a forager's memoir. I've also been calling her Ileana for a long time. And I heard her name mentioned. I think I was listening to a review of the book and it's Elena. So oh, okay. good to know. And this is the follow up to her memoir called Burn the Place. And it's about her time in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. She and her wife have purchased a very, very remote house in the Upper Peninsula, and they've opened an inn called the Milkweed Inn that's only open from May to October because of the weather up there. And she serves things there that she forages and preserves. She does a lot of preserving, even of greens. She makes vinegars out of things. It's a beautifully written book. During the pandemic, she got an MFA and I thought Burn the Place was a well-written book. This one is beautifully written. One of the things she talks a lot about in the book is her gender dysmorphia. She had three older sisters. They were much older than her. And when her mother became pregnant, she and her father were convinced that this fourth one was going to be the boy that the father had always wanted and ended up being a girl. But he treated her a lot like a boy. And she felt a lot like a boy 
or never felt like a girl, maybe is the better way to say it. So she talks a lot about that. And then she also talks about the wild kingdom that she lives in. So this little passage I wanted to read is about mushrooms, because she relates a lot of things in the book to mushrooms. It's hard for us as a species to understand anything if it's not in relation to us. We've completely altered the world to our liking, and even within that, we've divided ourselves into so many categories, which when you consider things are constricting. Things shouldn't have to be so certain. By dividing ourselves, we create the boxes we work so hard over the course of our lives to escape. There are some things about our species that are quite beautiful, and I could go on and on, but instead what I want to tell you about is the mushroom which is a beautiful and, in a sense, genderless organism. The spores come from the fruiting body, the ephemeral sex organ, which can be likened to a sperm or egg. But it's probably more accurate to call it an egg. And the oxygen, trees, rivers, sun, and rain, everything is the world, is the path the egg travels, the way human eggs travel through mother's fallopian tubes. The spores are carried by the wind, on animals, the feathers of birds, the cuffs of our pants, and in the hairs of our arms. And when they fall, it's as though the soil, the environment overall, becomes like the uterine lining. Here is where they then begin, in a way, to become embryos. Isn't that fascinating? She really talks about things like that and relates the bigger world to her own place in it which I appreciated. She was the owner of Elizabeth, which was a revered restaurant in Chicago. I think she worked there for about eight years. And she's also known in the industry because when she didn't want to work there anymore, she gave it away to her employees, which is not the typical way that things work. So it's her time in rural Indiana on a 10 acre farm And then her time now on a 250 acre property in a very remote part of Michigan. Hmm. I really enjoyed it. Again, that's called Fieldwork, a forager's memoir by Elena Reagan. Very cool. You know, I recently listened to a podcast episode. Uh, The American Library Association has a podcast called Call Number, I believe. And I listened to an older episode about horror It was an October episode, so they were talking about horror. And one of the trends in horror fiction is mushrooms. Oh, interesting. Yeah, totally interesting, right? But I guess, you know, the thing is they pop up suddenly, they grow fast, they grow in strange places, Places they kill people. (laughs) (laughs) That too. Yes. So uh, mushrooms. Interesting. Well, she talks about how she's very careful. And she has foraged for mushrooms for years and years. And if she has any doubt, you know, she does not serve them. Yeah. I mean, that wouldn't go over very well. Because <laughs> she was saying, yes, they can kill you, but they can also just make you really sick. So you have to be careful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. <laughs> mushrooms in horror. I mean, I'm a little afraid of them. I've told you that. So I don't mind buying them in the grocery store, but I'm not a big fan myself of going out and hunting for them. Yeah, I don't think I would. I mean, I know my mom did when she was a kid. They Mm -hmm. went foraging for mushrooms. and But yeah, I'm a nervous Nelly. Yeah, same. (laughs) So I read Wilma Rogers by Sophia Belzer Engstrand. This is a book that I discovered quite accidentally, never heard of the author. I was at the Institute Library in New Haven looking for novels by Marion Engel. I saw this book. The spine is kind of faded and it was on the top shelf. So I I pulled it down because I wasn't sure, hoping that it was by Marion Engel. But it was this book by Sophia Belzer Engstrand. And I opened the front cover and pasted inside is a little cutout. And this is the description of the book. In Wilma Rogers, she tells the story of a girl who became public librarian in the small town of Milo, Illinois. No one in the town knew better than she all the petty scandals and intrigues that tangled the lives of Milo's citizens. For at her library desk, she heard many stories, and by observing the reading tastes of her patrons, she learned even more. So this book came out in 1941, and I'd never heard of this author 
but I thought, oh, librarian, Illinois. I'm from Illinois originally. I'm a newly minted librarian. I'll check this one out and see what it's about. And I figured, you know, I might read the first couple pages or the first chapter. I got into this book and read it really swiftly. And it is, it's, you know, it's pretty sizable. It's 352 pages, but it went down like honey, really enjoyed it. The author did get a degree in library science. So she knew what she was talking about and oh, where to start. She talks so much about the conditions of life for a professional working woman and the societal attitudes towards women, working women, mothers, very fascinating, working with the library board. It was a profession, but there weren't employment standards. There weren't a lot of employment standards, perhaps, for a lot of professions at that time. So librarians didn't have contracts. There wasn't a union. So you were fired and hired by personal whim sometimes. In this case, the town of Milo, the president is the wealthy man in town who owns the corn plant and is extremely wealthy. He married into the family. It was his father-in-law who had kind of settled the area and established this plant and made his wealth from that. But he's kept the plant, his corn plant, out of the town limits. So he doesn't have to pay taxes on anything, right? So it's a small storefront library that has no income hardly at all. And the woman who had been working there for like 25, 30 years wasn't professionally trained, but she's trying to keep it going. So she gets ill or her brother is ill and she has to go away to take care of him. And that's why Wilma is hired. When she meets the president of the library board, who is the wealthy man in town, this is a scene I just want to read. As they shook hands, he said, the photograph on your application did not do you justice. His glance went down the length of her and quickly returned to her face. Are you sure you're a librarian? Oh, my God. So, you know, so that's the kind of stuff that, you know. Wouldn't go over so well these days. Wouldn't go over so well these days. It still happens. People probably think it. But I don't want to give any spoilers, even though this book is so hard to find. I'm trying to find a copy for myself to purchase. Can't find it anywhere at all. Overall, I have to say it was a good story. And when Emily and I were talking a couple days ago about the book, had I read this book in the 90s, I would have thought, well, that's a nice historical snapshot of how things were back then. But now reading it in 2023, when there are so many challenges to women's rights in the country here in the United States going on, and archaic attitudes are coming back, it read really contemporary, I have to say, yeah. which is frightening to mm -hmm. think about. But I enjoyed it. It was a good snapshot of what life was like back then. She lives in a boarding house, which is interesting to think about. I'd, I've never lived in a boarding house, kind of like a permanent bed and breakfast, right? Yeah. And there are some twists and turns that I didn't see coming. So it's probably one thing that kept it going for me. Again, that was Wilma Rogers by Sophia Engstrand. And more to come about her, I'm sure. I finished My Murder, a novel by Katie Williams. And this is the book I picked up when I was really quite done with my project and was like, but I can't read. And I was getting frustrated. So I wanted to pick up something that I wouldn't typically read. And this title caught my eye. I purchased this when I was with Aunt Ellen in Berkeley at that thrift store that had the books organized by color. Yes. And just the title on the spine caught my eye, My Murder. And this book comes out the day this episode airs on June 6th. So it was an arc when I picked it up. So this is about Louise, who's been brought back to life after she's the victim of a serial killer. Sounds so bizarre. <laughs> it's very bizarre. And she is the fifth victim of this serial killer. So she reenters her life and her family. She has a nine month old baby who kind of is a little reticent to be spending time with her because they're not like being raised from the dead. They're being cloned. So there's a replication commission that decides who's 
going to be cloned and, you know, quote, brought back to life. So they remember who they are and their family recognizes them. They look exactly the same. But to the baby, she might not have smelled exactly the same or something. She and these other four women attend a serial killer survival group meeting. It takes place in, I mean, obviously, if people are being cloned, it's not in this day and age, but it's not like dystopian future or anything like that. There's no world building per se. The author is touching on things that already kind of exist. So like when they get in something that we would think of as an Uber, it's a self-driving Uber Mm -hmm. that they just call auto, the auto arrived, that sort of thing. So, you know, we already are talking about self-driving cars and things like that. So for my mind, it wasn't too much of a stretch to think about a world like that. And then when the babysitter comes over to take care of her daughter, she's got glasses on and is essentially talking to all of her friends through her glasses. <laughs> you know, So there's things like that. They call things that they carry around with them, the screens. And her job is where she works for a company where she enters a room and puts on a padded suit that makes her look like a much older woman. And then people beam in like Star Trek, and they can appear however they want. But her job is one of those people who essentially just hugs people and provides touch. So I thought that was an interesting part of the story as well. Mm Because the more technology in our lives, maybe the less actual touch we have. So it is a novel. I don't in any way want to spoil what it's about. I will just say that the five women in the serial killer support group decide that they want to interact with the serial killer. And I'm going to leave it there. So they were all murdered by the same serial killer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. It's a thriller with an interesting twist on the concept of who has the power in these sort of situations and who kills who, et cetera. Again, not going to say it anything more. The other thing that I thought was lovely is that the main protagonist has her parents are two dads. It's a non-issue. Right. It's just a fact. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the way things are in the world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. And one of them plays a really important role in the book as well. So again, Easy title to remember, My Murder, Katie Williams, available now. Very cool. It kind of makes me think a little bit about that book. I read The Final Girl Support Group. Yes. Was that Riley Sager who wrote that one? I thought that was Grady Hendricks. Grady Hendricks. Or was it Riley Sager? I'm sorry, I don't don't remember exactly. But yeah, but a different twist. Yes. Yeah. And kind of taking back the power. Mm -hmm. That's what this book is a little bit about. So we both read our second quarter read along the reading list by Sarah Nisha Adams. Towards the end of this episode, we have a wonderful interview with her. And we wanted to just talk about it a little bit. Yeah, you know, this is a book about books, which is our theme for our 2023 read alongs. And we wanted to choose something that was not too heavy, that was more uplifting. And I was surprised that this book does have a deep heaviness to it. Yeah. Yeah. We chose it because it's contemporary. Whereas Parnassus on Wheels, you know, was written a long time ago. This one was published in 2021. The premise of it is it's about Mukesh, who is a widower. And he's being gently harassed by his three daughters because they don't think he's living well, he's not eating the right foods, he's not exercising, he's not taking very good care of himself. Yeah, he's not going out and socializing, right. things like that. It's two years since his wife passed. And they think it's time for him to start re entering the world in the way they think is the right way to re enter yes, the world. Yes. So he finds a book, I think, is it under the bed, he finds a copy of the time traveler's wife. Yes. So his wife was a big reader. Right. And shortly after she passed, the daughters cleaned out the house and they returned her library books that she had a stack on her bedside table. But this is the one that got away. And it was covered in dust underneath the bed. Time Traveler's Wife by Audrey Neffenegger. And he had not been a reader. He was a television watcher. His wife was an avid reader. He enjoyed watching her read. And she had a lovely relationship with their granddaughter, Priya, 
who was also an avid reader and would come into the house entering with her nose in a book. Yeah, and and they had bonded over books, the grandmother and, and Priya. Right. So he's sad that the granddaughter doesn't want to bond with him over television watching. Mm -hmm. Right. So with this book, he ends up reading the book and it really helps give him language and understanding of his own grief and his own situation and heartache. I think that's one of the things we've talked about before that books, novels, nonfiction can give us the language that we need to express ourselves or to help us understand how we're feeling. Right. So I feel so alone. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I was sucked into this book. Yes. Very early on. So the reading list is a list of books that is discovered by Alicia initially, who's a library worker. It's a summer job. It's her quote, shitty summer job that her older brother encouraged her to take. I don't remember enough. He had worked at the library. Or as a younger man, he spent a lot of time at the library and he encourages her to take the job. She's not a reader or anything. And when Mukesh first comes into the library to return the book, she is rude to him and he gets angry. I listened to the audio book too, and it has different narrators. So it was really great to hear his voice and his frustration. So he actually ends up complaining about her which I think is very important to do because managers don't know there's a problem unless somebody tells them, says former manager. And her supervisor says to her, you were rude. You can't be rude. This is customer service. You need to be nice to people. Right. (laughs) Then she finds this list because after Mukesh reads The Time Traveler's Wife, he wants a recommendation. And she just found this list and was reading the first book. And she's like, oh, I'll recommend this book to him. And the story completely takes off from there. Shall I read the list of books on the reading list? That'd be great. To Kill a Mockingbird, Rebecca, The Kite Runner, Life of Pi, Pride and Prejudice, Little Women, Beloved, and A Suitable Boy. And so she's she's not much of a reader either. So she's fearful of having to recommend books to people. So this list has come in very handy. And at the top of this list, it says, just in case you need it. Yeah. And now just spoiler alert, this is a read along discussion book. So we might have spoilers a little bit. If you don't want to hear anything, you might want to skip over. But yeah, so these books, and it's the first initial books really help both Alicia and Mukesh with what they're going through in their life. It gives them language. It gives them comfort that they're not alone. It gives them confidence and the push to try something different, to try something new. And also how to have ways to communicate with each other Mm -hmm. because you have something common to talk about. Right, exactly. Which I think was really helpful for both of them. And there's a huge age difference between the two. And a lovely relationship develops around this entry point of books, but they get to know each other. Yeah. And they become friends and neither one of them knows about the circumstances of their life as new friends don't. That slowly gets revealed as trust is built. And Alicia is comes from a very troubled home. Her parents divorced when she was pretty young and her mother may have had mental health issues already that were exacerbated by the divorce. And mom is a freelance graphic artist. So she goes through phases where she's working and everything's fine. And then she has periods where she's really incapacitated and can't get out of bed. Alicia and her brother are trying to make things work. Right. And her brother's quite a bit older than her. He's about six years older than her. And so he's out in the world working trying to keep the family going. Yeah. Their mother is a single mother. The father is very non-existent. He shows up just a little bit in the book, not very helpful. And so Aiden's suffering from a lot of his own pressure of being 24 and trying to keep the family afloat. Right. Yeah. Aiden, the older brother. And, you know, in the Zoom conversation we had with listeners, it was interesting because some people didn't think it was a realistic portrayal of their situation, others thought it was. So I think a lot of it might have to do with just people's own experience 
which is something else that the book talks about. The book talks about how we bring ourselves to our reading experience. And we could really see that during the Zoom discussion, that people's own experience, particularly with mental health and with widowhood, influenced how this book impacted them. Right. And where you are in widowhood, too, is, yes. a, is a big difference there. Yeah. 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 And one person, one of our listeners, Susan, even said she felt like it has to do with the gender of the widow that's left behind. This was a situation where there were daughters and their father. And how would it be if it was daughters and a mother? And I think some of it has to do with gender. I think also it has to do with the role that the person played in their couple. I worked quite often with widows who never dealt with the finances of their home. And when their partner passed away, they were overwhelmed with that because they had never written a check. Right. You know? And in my experience, I had an uncle after my aunt passed away, he had never even opened the mail. Mm -hmm. He didn't do anything yeah. householdy. So he was completely lost when he lost his wife. Right. And for Mukesh, one of the things he's lost in is the world of food. Food plays a huge part in this book, but he doesn't really know how to cook very well. And his daughters are getting frustrated, even to the point that he drinks powdered chai that's kind of sweetened tea, you yeah. know, and they're worried. Don't keep drinking that. It's too sweet. <laughs> right. Yeah. He has the staples that he makes for himself. And they're like, you can't just eat beans all the time. Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah. The food is wonderful in this book, though. I was hungry quite a bit as I was reading it. <laughs> You know, I don't think we want to completely spoil it. There are some surprising turns that the novel takes. And the subject matter wasn't as light as we thought it was going to be. I really enjoyed it, but it did shock me a little bit, some of the turns. And right. I would say there are some trigger warnings for mental health and suicide. Yes, for sure. Yeah. But overall, it's a heartwarming book. I think I said in my brief Goodreads review that it's a book that's good for the heart and soul. Mm -hmm. As one of the taglines on the book says, some books change your life forever. And I think some of the books that have changed my life are the ones I've read and discussed with other people. Yeah. And that's the list of books that we talked about at the beginning of the book keeps popping up mm -hmm. throughout. And then the, for one different of, people. Right. Yeah. And one of the mysteries is, well, who wrote the original list? And that is revealed at the end. We will not reveal it to you. <laughs> no. You must read it to find out. <laughs> yes. Exactly. I'm very glad that we read it. I am too. It was a fast read. And as I said, I listened to the audio and I read the book. The audio was really well done. I didn't write down the narrator's names. I apologize for that, but it's three different people. It was very enjoyable. The Reading List by Sarah Nisha Adams. This episode is sponsored by The Marriage Box by Corey Ajmi has been listed by Katie Couric Media as a must read book. The novel follows Casey Cohen, who is forced to leave New Orleans at 16 and return to her parents' roots in the Orthodox Syrian Jewish community in Brooklyn to get married. The book develops Casey's conflicted emotions with finesse, contrasting the allure of 1980s music, fashion, and television with the strict rituals of Sephardic Orthodox Judaism. From the spicy scent of cumin to the gleam of gold bracelets and silver Shabbat candlesticks, the marriage box recreates a defiant young woman's vibrant and insular world. The marriage box is available for purchase now. Check the show notes for links. Biblio Adventures. Oh my gosh. It's been nice to get out and just have a good browse at a bookstore. I went to the book barn up in Niantic one day. It's a huge place with multiple locations in town. So I usually have a list that I'm going to check out. When you first walk into the main barn area, and this is outside, they have new books that have just come in. They're all up. They're not in alphabetical order or anything. So you do have to do a nice browse through them, which I always enjoy. And I found a couple treasures that way. And I'll talk about one right now. It is a book that is not even out yet. It's called Creep, Accusations and Confessions by Miriam Gerba. This book comes out September 5th. So I attended an event in May. It was an online event by Simon & Schuster, their fall preview event. It was with five authors, each talking with their editor 
about their forthcoming book, which I thought was a great idea. And Emily and I talked about it that as an author, a writer is so close to their work, and they can't necessarily see it that well, or imagine how an outsider would interpret it or understand it. And we were talking about how an editor has to be the most intimate person with a book, because they're there, they've read it, they've read it in draft form, they've talked with the author many times, and they know the story inside and out, and can imagine how readers might receive it. So it was really cool to see these authors talk with their editor. I'll just say them really quickly. Sophia Sinclair, author of How to Say Babylon, talked with her editor, Don Davis. Her book is a memoir about growing up Rastafarian in Jamaica. And that book comes out October 3rd. Next up was Miriam Gerba. Her new book, Creep, is coming out September 5th. She was in conversation with her editor, Lauren Wine. Stephanie Land, her next book, Class, A Memoir of Motherhood, Hunger, and Higher Education, comes out November 7th. She was in conversation with editor Julia Scheifetz. I am not sure if I'm mutilating her name. I apologize. One note that I have here is Stephanie was the author of the book Made, which was very popular not too long ago. It um, has recently been made into, I think, a television a series. series yeah. yeah. So Stephanie, in the meantime, has earned an MFA, hmm. which she says stands for motherfucking assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my. Um, then uh, Nicole Walters, her book, Nothing is Missing, another memoir that's a motivational memoir is coming out October 10th. And she was in conversation with editor Leah Miller. And Nothing is Missing is exactly what it sounds like. Like it's a motivational book about how to live your best life, but that nothing is missing right now either. Sounds like being present. And then the last author was Melissa Broder. Her novel, Death Valley, is coming out October 24th, and she was in conversation with her editor, Kara Watson. This book sounds like it's going to be a trip, and probably up your alley, Emily, because it has magical realism in it. The spark for the book was when she was out west on a vacation with her husband, and she went out for a hike in the morning and got lost in the desert. And she's like, you know, I had like a bottle of Coke with me and like nothing. <laughs> And she's like, here I am, like lost in the desert. She's not, not granted, I was lost for 20 minutes. But that sparked the idea for this novel. And she has written poetry in the past. So um, highly anticipated novel by her. She's a trip in general. I mean, I did a virtual event with her. And I can't even picture her in the desert. Because I think in the virtual event, she's sitting in a white fluffy chair. Or something, yeah. <laughs> <you know? She's> <laughs> yeah, well, this book, I can't wait to read it. Because one of the characters in the book is actually Best Western. <laughs> do, you, do you remember the hotel <laughs> yes. chain? And she was just really dryly funny. Yes. So yeah, I do look forward to that book. Yeah, so it was a nice browse at the book barn. I have to say. Yeah, yeah, she got me my copy of Devil in the Grove by Gilbert King. Thank you. Yes. And I also found a book that I had to buy just because Emily and I recently read Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck. They have a local history section and I always browse the Connecticut section just to see what's there. And I found this book called Travels Without Charlie. <laughs> and it's by Bill Gorleski who was a Connecticut writer and was inspired by reading Travels with Charlie to do his own cross-country road trip in the later 1960s. It's a thin book. It's just squeaking over 100 pages, and I thought it would be fun. He also inscribed it to a friend, to Jamie, enjoy my road trip across the country, and he signed this on November 20th, 1993. That's so cool. Yeah. When was this published? 1993. It's a self-published book. Uh, I think that might be a lot of fun. Yeah. And there's a little picture of his camper in there, too. Yeah. He He had a camper attached to a car, which I think was his sister's car. uh, But we'll find out more on that. As opposed to Steinbeck's setup, which was a pickup truck with a camper top on it. Right. Yeah. Well, I just want to briefly mention another podcast that I just started listening to. It's by the American Writers Museum. The title is Nation of Writers. 
I don't know, I don't remember if I knew about this and forgot, but the other day when I was looking, uh, kind of revising my podcasts and refreshing things, I came across it and I listened to their episode on Edith Wharton, which I thought would be a good one to start with since I enjoy her so much. So the host of the podcast, or at least this episode, I don't know if they have a rotating host, it's Nate King, and he was talking with Anne Schuyler from The Mount. She's the Curatorial and Visitor Services Director, which Emily and I, we met her when we were up at The Mount. So it was with Anne and then also Emily J. Orlando, who's Professor of English at Fairfield University here in Connecticut. And he would ask a question and they would just take off talking about Edith Wharton and whatever the prompt was. And I enjoy the conversation so much. They even brought up Ulysses at one point because they talked about Edith Wharton's library, which is, you know, from that episode and the Biblio adventure Emily and I had to the Mount was focused on Edith Wharton's library, which are her books that she herself owned and which was brought back together in pretty recent years. Apparently, Edith Wharton had a copy of Ulysses. It was a pre-publication copy. It was a friend's copy. And it's one of the surprising books that's in the collection because she did not like James Joyce. She thought Ulysses was, I'm going to mutilate the quote, but basically schoolboy pornography. Mm. Which I'm just like, yes, totally. Because me, I'm currently reading Ulysses, right? And in some of the focus on intercourse and penises, it just reads really young. But she had this copy and it was from a friend who passed away. When he died in his will, he had given his library to somebody else, but said that Edith Wharton got first pick. And so she chose 100 books from his library and one of them was that pre-publication copy of ulysses remember when we were there how they showed us all her marginalia mm-hmm. i wonder what she wrote if if she wrote in that right one. well or if she if she chose that one after she had already read it because she knew it was significant mm. they, they don't really know for sure mm-hmm. i guess i i could find out i maybe ask Anne when that person died and when she got this copy, because that that would be an interesting thing. So my point also is I enjoyed their interview very much, their conversation, but it's also fun now to have an idea of what Ulysses is so that I can better appreciate when people are bringing the book up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the point of reading some of those old classics because they're just referred to so much. Exactly. You know, and they, they've influenced other writers, right? Either, to emulate or to push against. It's just kind of fun. So again, that's the American Writers Museum podcast, Nation of Writers. Check it out. I plan on listening to more. So upcoming Biblio adventures, what's on your calendar? I have a joint jump planned with my buddy across the table. Thursday, June 8th at Charter Books in Newport, Rhode Island, which is a place we've been wanting to get to together. I've never been. I think Chris has been. The author Claire Fuller is coming to the States. She's a UK author and her book, The Memory of Animals, which we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, is our Patreon giveaway this month. It's just coming out on June 6th. So she's just starting a book tour next week. So we're going to head to Charter Books, and then we're also hoping to go to the Redwood Library in Athenaeum, which is the oldest membership library in the country. Oh, I can't wait. I have been wanting to go to that place for a long time. We have a fun day planned next week. Yes. Do you have any other upcoming jaunts? I have one on the calendar that's on Wednesday, June 7th at 6 p.m. The New Haven Library, the main New Haven Library there on the green has an event called Preserving Your History, which is for the general public and how to preserve your family records, your own records, photographs, and things like that. I thought it would be really interesting to attend an event like that to see how they run it, because I hope to have a job in the future where I could possibly do things like that. Yeah. Um, I think that'd be a lot of fun. So, And also picking up tips and pointers as well. So Very yeah, fun. next Wednesday. Very cool. I've not, I've only been to that library once and it was with you a long time ago. Yeah, you know, I've been a couple times and I guess I don't go a lot because I find myself at the Institute Library or Sterling. Yeah. 
But yeah, they have a really cool maker space now and a cafe. So the next time we're in New Haven, we should definitely yeah. stop in and that's a great have idea. a browse and maybe a coffee at the cafe. Yeah. All right, so upcoming reads. Well, we both have a read. It's going to be a reread for me and a first for you of Life B, Overcoming Double Depression. This is by Beth Ann Patrick. It just came out on May 16th. She's going to be a future author spotlight for us. And she's known as the book maven on Twitter. For some of you who might follow her, she does the Friday reads hashtag. Yeah, she's the one who created that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very popular. And so if you follow it, your TBR will explode. But I really enjoy it. The book is about her getting kind of a late in life proper diagnosis. So she understands the mental health challenges she's had over the years. I mean, at this point, she has grown children. And so it's really interesting how it's impacted her life. It's really well written. I enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to a reread. Good. I'm looking forward to reading it. Yeah. Well, a book that's on my to-be-read pile is a new one to me, but it's an old one to the world. This one came out in 1942. It's another book by Sophia Engstrand. This one is called Julie Morrow. It has a great dust jacket cover, very early 1940s of a working woman with her briefcase walking towards some town buildings. And so Engstrand... Her mission was to write novels about modern professional women in different fields. And I believe this one is about a social worker. I ordered it online. I actually found a copy on Etsy for like eight bucks. And I was amazed to find that. And I cannot for the life of me find a copy of Wilma Rogers, the other book I read. But she is also from the Chicago area and actually went to my high school Kismet. I can't believe that. I Because I was like, who is this woman and where is she from? And so I didn't find much about her just with a general Google search, but I went to newspapers.com and found some articles. And one of them mentioned that she graduated from Morton High School in Cicero, Illinois. And I was like, what? Get out. <laughs> like, So that was super exciting. She grew up in Berwyn, which is a town next to Cicero. So more to come on Sophia Engstrand and Julie Morrow, her novel. When I first got Wilma Rogers, I thought, how unfortunate to name or to title a book a name of somebody, because I think it's challenging to just have a name because it doesn't tell you anything. But now that I know that her mission was to write novels about professional women, it makes sense now that she titled it after the character. But I think a nod to the subject of the book would have been helpful. Like Julie Morrow, comma, social worker? Yeah. Or MSW? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, or something. But because yeah. um, you never know, like, what is it that keeps a book in the public eye? Mm -hmm. Titles really matter, they I do. think. Yeah, but that cover definitely is eye catching. Yeah, we'll yeah. totally post a picture of it. So in the out now category, Moby Dyke by Krista Burton is available now. Woo That's one that I'm reading. I didn't mention it earlier because I haven't read it in a few days, but yeah. Coming up next is our conversation with Sarah Nisha Adams. Sarah, we are going to be talking at length before this interview about what the book's about, but we still want to ask you to kind of give maybe your elevator pitch, but also why you decided to write the book. Yeah, I always find this so hard. I feel like other people can sum up my book much better than I can. Um, but ultimately, this is a story of an unlikely friendship between Mukesh Patel, who is a widower, and he lost his wife two years before. He's trying desperately to connect with his bookworm granddaughter, kind of fill the hole that his wife left in her life too. So he heads to his local library where he meets reluctant library worker Alicia. She's there as a summer job. Um, she doesn't really read books. So that gives her a great benefit to that job, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> and Mukesh tries to ask her for some book recommendations. And at first she has absolutely none, kind of is quite rude 
to him so they get off on a bad foot and then we see Alicia discovering a list of books and she realizes that's a place to start so she starts reading them and recommending them to Mukesh and through the books these two very different people find out that they have much more in common than they first thought and it's a way for them to kind of connect with their own struggles as well and realize what they're going through as well as forming a friendship on the way. So I wrote this book because I just really wanted to write a book about libraries and the important places that they are, both in terms of being somewhere where you can get loads of books and you don't have to limit yourself or just pick one. You can just pick loads, which for me as a child was like the greatest thing ever, especially in the UK where finding that library funding is being cut in lots of places. Lots of libraries have closed down or reduce services and things like that. I think in recent years, we are finding that libraries are being better funded. But I remember when I was younger, my local library closed down and that was such a huge thing for me. I was a teenager at that time, so I'd had the benefit of having a library through most of my childhood. But I thought about the people who wouldn't have that anymore. So I really wanted to focus on how important libraries are as spaces to get books, but also as places for people to be and feel safe and the idea that there are so few places I think in the community where you can just go and you don't have to spend any money and you can just sit and be for a bit I think there are such important places just for the community in itself as well oh thank you for that you touched on a lot of questions and points of conversation that we had with a group of listeners the other day on a zoom conversation one of them being about the closing of libraries in in England and People were wondering if it was a budgetary thing or if it was a subscription based situation, but it it does sound like it was a budgetary situation. And I mean, this might be a little bit in the weeds, but is it like a national budget? And then are there local budgets for libraries as as well? Is it a combination of things? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how. I think all libraries are funded in slightly different ways around the world. But I think in the UK, they're mainly government funded, or at least public libraries are. And I think each separate council in different areas will have different budgets for their local libraries. So I think there are some places that have the most amazing libraries, but there are also some places that probably don't have the budget to fully fund their libraries. I think there have been some cases where libraries as well have been taken over. So they're part community run as well so they're sort of part funded by the government um, and councils and part funded by communities or volunteer run which I think we saw a lot of that hybrid stuff going on for a while yeah I really hope that there's like a big resurgence I know so many people and so many readers really got behind saving libraries and kind of petitioning for it and petitioning in so many ways and I think libraries have thought about how they can adapt as well to show how relevant they are and how important they are in the communities if they need to do that at all because I think lots of people already were aware but I think they offer so many services now so kind of libraries have to do an awful lot more than they used to in order to get that funding but I think people who use them really really value them I just kind of wish people used them more because I think now getting books online quite cheaply is quite easy but I think there's nothing better than walking into a library just knowing that you can literally pick up almost anything you want. Yes, yes, for sure. I heard, um, I'm sorry, I just mm -hmm. saw a very brief thing the other day that some people are turning to libraries, ordering their books online through the library, you know, putting books on hold as a way to stop impulsive online buying. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think it's very wise. I do that now because I was buying so many books that I just didn't get around to reading. Mm -hmm. But when you're like waiting for the book to come available at the library, that day when you get the email and it's ready to pick up, it's very exciting. Yes. (laughs) And sometimes I just, I have to admit, I take books out of the library just because I wish I could read it. And then it's a pleasure to see (laughs) it sitting on my counter for a little while. While, but yeah, Sarah, we thought we'd ask you about the eight books that you decided to include as the official reading list. We're going to read them off so listeners know what they are. And then we'd like to know why you chose these eight. To Kill a Mockingbird, Rebecca, The Kite Runner, Life of Pi, Pride and Prejudice, Little Women, Beloved, and A Suitable Boy. Yeah, so I love all these books. They're basically all books I discovered when I was falling in love with reading 
for the first time. Well, in many ways, I've always been a reader, but I remember all these books were books that I read at that point in your life when reading sort of takes over. So I was a teenager and they all really stayed with me. Quite a lot of them were recommended to me by my English teacher when I was really looking for something to read beyond the curriculum and the books that we were reading at school. And they just felt so different and I kind of hadn't read anything like them before. I just loved them all and I think they were all so different and they focus on different time periods and they're set around the world. And that sort of epitomizes what I was reading at the time. I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but the person who wrote the list, it, it felt right to me that they would be these books. I did cheat a bit that this was basically the, fir- the first books that came to my mind. I think there are a few that kind of got taken off and put back on um, or rejigged in terms of where they sat on the list. But ultimately, these books were the first ones that came to mind when I thought of the story at all. And I thought that there was going to be a reading list because they feel like a really good place to start and books that people really want to share. Oh, that's great. So just so you know, of the group of people we talked with the other day, there were 20 of us. And the average of all of us who have read from this list was 4.85 books read from the list. That's pretty good. And, and there were like, I think two people who've read them all. Um, yeah. Yeah. And a suitable boy is one that I think is going on a lot of people's list, even though it seems quite intimidating at 1200 pages. Yeah, I love that book so much, though. I read it in a week, and I don't know how. I think it was when I was a teenager and time went really slowly. So I just read it one week in my summer holidays, and I loved it so much. That's a book I really want to reread again and again and again. I remember trying to write about A Suitable Boy in the book, and sort of there's so much that happens in it. I almost just wanted to put a little teaser in to set people on their way. But it's interesting because when I talk to readers, that's the book that comes up most that people want to read. And I find that really interesting because in many ways, it's the most daunting because it's Mm. absolutely massive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of our listeners who had read it, she said it's totally worth it. But we, we also had a burning question from Julie. She was wondering if part of the reason you put that book in, since it is so big, Was it a plot device just to be able to get the wrinkles out of the reading list? (laughs) I mean, I chose the book before I thought about that part, but it worked perfectly. And let's face it, like nothing works better than a really big, massive book to, yeah, Yeah. flatten out a piece of paper. (laughs) That's so funny. Um, The Jane Austen part too, Pride and Prejudice is on the list and the book doesn't get a totally great, you know, reception no. from some of the readers. But I really love that you say, I know if it was Alicia who said, you know, it's just a device that she does so that these characters are being separated from each other. And I thought it's the first will they won't they kind of storyline that is so popular now, especially in romantic stories or even sitcoms. Will they or won't they get together? So thank you for that. There was a great connection. (laughs) That's okay. I do get a lot of messages from people as well, feeling a bit hurt on Jane Austen's behalf about Pride and Prejudice. But personally, I love Pride and Prejudice. And I just felt the characters couldn't love every single book on the list like I do, because it just wouldn't be realistic. And I thought if anyone can take one for the team, it's Jane Austen. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And I'm sure if Alicia revisits that book in years to come, she'll love it even more. Um, But yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, I like that a lot. Because I remember the first time I tried to read Pride and Prejudice, I was just like, oh, this is just not happening for me. And then it it took a couple years again before I picked it up and really made it through. And, you know, watching the movies actually helped me with the books and then just getting into the language of it. So I thought it was a very realistic portrayal of what it's like for some readers to come to that novel. Yeah, absolutely. The main character, Alicia, has a very complicated home life. Her mother is suffering from depression and agoraphobia, and her brother Aiden is quietly suffering as well. Why was it important for you to address mental illness in this book? Yeah, so I often get asked about this. And for me, I started the story knowing that it was going to be a book that tackles 
mental health and mental illness as well because it's a subject really close to my heart i know lots of people who live with depression and i've lost loved ones to depression too and i just feel that there is still a stigma around it all and i would really love to write something that was accessible and spoke about it in what i hope was a realistic way and sometimes the way that it feels when someone you love is going through that and especially when you feel you can't talk about it and i think with alicia she's really struggling to tell her friends about it she doesn't want to admit it to herself and she's having to live with it all on her own and i think especially in some communities mental health and mental illness is still something that is quite taboo and people don't talk about it so alicia and aiden are having to really cope with everything on their own and i also wanted to point out just the idea that sometimes the strongest people in your lives are sometimes the people who are going through the most and it can make such a huge difference if you can just ask them how they are or just check in sometimes because I think sometimes we can get wrapped up in our own worlds and forget that but I also wanted to focus on the hope as well and how the books give Alicia a coping mechanism in many ways though at points she resents them while also showing that even in the darkest of times and when tragedy strikes, there can still be hope afterwards and there are still people out there who will look after you and care for you. And I think Alicia finds that in Mukesh. So it was a really important topic for me to include. I really wanted to talk about it in an open way, but also I think sometimes it can feel shocking and surprising to us because sometimes the people we're closest to, we don't know always what's going on with them. And they're the people we love the most. And if we can reach out and make them feel that they can talk about it, that can hopefully be a step towards lifting um, lifting what they're going through a little bit. Yeah, yeah for Thank sure. Thank you for that, yeah. Saren. You. you know, we're sorry for your loss that you've yes. experienced. And, you know, I just want to say also, well, I want to say two things. You writing this book has helped people are ready to be able to have conversations. I mean, I can tell that just from the conversation we had with our listeners on Sunday evening, but also not to be afraid. I think some people are afraid they're going to say the wrong thing or they don't know how to say it, but just being willing to be vulnerable and take the risk with the people you love and just ask, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause Mukesh is very uncomfortable, but he still shows up. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you know, there's exactly, yeah, not a lot to say about being there. Yeah, thank you so much thank for you. adding to the conversation. Yeah, what I really loved about the book very early on and that kept me captured is how people react to the different books. And then for Mukesh, reading The Time Traveler's Wife, which is not one of the books on the list. It's a library book that was found under the bed, all dusty and everything after his wife passed away. But that story gives him the language for his own feelings. And so often, I think when you're grieving or going through mental health challenges, if you're able to read, it can help you put names to feelings and to know that there's somebody out there, at least in the fictional landscape, who feels the way that you do when you feel like yeah. no one has ever felt this awful. I think that was just one of the things that made me fall in love with the book very early on. And then Mukesh at the end, you know, he's the one talking to Alicia, like, it's not all escapism, like they show us the world books do. I really yeah. appreciated that very yeah. much. And often it's the people who are the closest to us are the ones we can't talk to. Right. And yeah. I think you really painted a portrait of that really well. And that the chosen family or the, in this case, it was more found family. I don't know that they chose each other. They came across each other in the library, yeah. you yeah. know, right. Really, really nice. You know, it was interesting because in our discussion, our zoom discussion, we had people of lots of different ages and we had women who were in their sixties and seventies say, you know, we had mental illness in our family and we could not talk about it at all. Yeah. And then younger people were saying this didn't seem realistic because, you know, they could have just gotten help. And it's like, yeah, that's not how it works. From the outside, you may look at it that way, but that's not what's happening always inside in the family structure. Yeah. Another thing that I really wanted to highlight through Alicia's story and Aidan's story was the idea that you never really know what people are going through and they might look really strong on the outside like they have everything together but sometimes 
that's not always the case. And I think sometimes the strongest people that you see are the people you need to ask, how are you doing? Or just give a little bit of kindness. And I think that's something that Alicia finds because at first she's quite rude to Mukesh and he gets quite annoyed with her, but she has so much going on in her life and he doesn't know that. But a little bit of kindness would go a long way. Um, So that's another thing I wanted to point out. Just in this world that we live in, and I think in busy cities in particular, people can be rushing about and not always think about the people that they're walking past and what they might be going through. And sometimes I think a smile or just like a kind word can really, I know it sounds so small and quite cliche and cringy, but I really do think it can just like lift someone's spirits a little bit because it's not going to change everything, but it can just show you that there are other people out there who care. Yeah. yeah. And it's just that little micro connection between humans. So important. Yeah. And, you know, with the family dynamic too, you know, Aiden and Alicia being the children, that's a harder dynamic as well, especially when you know your mom is suffering in her heart. She's been heartbroken after the divorce. And you think of Alicia, her normal is her normal. Yeah. And when you're a kid, you don't know that there are other possibilities and different ways of living, really. And I think the the books do help with that. And then her relationship with Mukesh, which I just love so much, because I didn't have grandfathers growing up. They both passed before I was around. So I always love a good grandfather story. <laughs> oh, I love well, talking about Mukesh, he has his own growth throughout the novel. He he kind of begins as a, a little bit of a you know doddering widow who his three daughters treat like he can't feed himself and take care of himself. And in a certain way, he's not doing a very good job of that. I mean, maybe not as bad as his daughters are painting it to be, but <laughs> he, you know, by the end of the novel, he's got agency in his life and knows how to open the library front door and is successfully <laughs> going in. So talk about that, what it was like to write this character of Mukesh. Yeah, I loved Mukesh. He was the first character, I think, who came to me, really. Um, I could just see him and I just sort of knew what he was like and what his worries were. But I really liked the dynamic between him and his daughters and how it shifts over time, because I think they naturally go into the role of caring for him but they're sort of forgetting to actually talk to him and that's what he needs he needs company he doesn't just need looking after in terms of feeding and cleaning his house and things like that but they want to help in a practical way so I really love that he then finds companionship elsewhere and that helps grow his confidence in sort of just telling his daughters what he needs a little bit more Yeah, he in many ways reminds me a little bit of my grandfather, but he's also a bit of all my grandparents mixed together, as well as me and my dad and my mum. He's sort of all the bits I love in everyone I know put together. Um, While also, I think even though he's widowed, I think lots of people who aren't widowed probably can relate to him just in terms of his loneliness and the loneliness that he feels and feeling like he's stuck in his routines and he doesn't quite know what to do and that library book that sends him to the library is just something that sort of shakes up his day and shakes up his routine and shows him that there are sort of new things that he can explore so I loved writing him he's just so fun and lovely just like a genuinely lovely character (laughs) to write yeah. yeah. Can we ask about your writing process? I know you have a second book coming out soon, and we'll definitely ask you questions about that, hopefully before we leave. But um, what was your process like writing this novel? Did you have an outline? Are you a panster, as they say? Do you Did you just <laughs> kind of let it rip? Yeah, so I'm normally a panster, but I wasn't with this book. And I think it's because of that, it's the first book that I actually finished writing or my others are like 75% of the way through and they're terrible but I've kind of had the idea for this book I knew exactly what started the story I knew exactly where it was going to end and I kind of knew what was going to happen in the middle and then I just wrote myself a really detailed outline I was actually getting everything together to submit to the Lucy Cavendish prize which is a fiction prize um for women writers and I thought I needed a deadline to focus on and that meant I had to write 20,000 words and have an outline of like 2,000 words or something. So it was really helpful just to have that to motivate me to actually put pen to paper. It really helped. I didn't get shortlisted for the Lucy Cavendish Prize, but it did make me just want to finish the book. Knowing where it was going and sort of 
the way it was going to unfold was really helpful because I was nervous about it. I was quite tight for time in terms of I was working as an editor and everything was really busy. So I would just wake up an hour early to just write some words and knowing what was going to happen was so helpful to me. I also read in a book somewhere, I can't remember, that it's quite mindful if you just spend 15 minutes in the morning looking out the window or sitting in the garden or being outside for a bit. So I did that for a bit. I was living in a top floor flat. We were looking out of our kind of skylight window. And I really found that in those 15 minutes, I was just thinking about what I was going to be writing for the next hour. And it helped me sort of really formulate what I needed the scene to do. Um, so that was like my thinking time. And then I would just give myself an hour to write down as much as I could. And then I had to get ready for work and leave the house. But I loved that because it meant that I was really doing something for myself first thing in the morning and working as an editor I was working on loads of other people's books and I loved that but it also meant that I kept thinking oh what why am I not working on mine but having done something in the morning I could then like properly focus on my job and I felt like my book is turning into an actual book now it took me about three months to write a first draft and it was really messy and quite huge maybe 120,000 words and I had to cut out a lot but it was a first draft and I'd finished it and I had everything in there that I needed well kind of and then I had to <laughs> strip back and like layer some more things in and the editing process was really long but I had a finished book so I tried to replicate that same process with my second book and it really did not work in the same way <laughs> but I tried. <laughs> Tell us about your second book. <laughs> yeah so my second book is called The Twilight Garden and it's again a story of unlikely friendships but it's set in a community garden but you meet two neighbours Winston and Bernice who live next door and they have this shared garden that's completely overgrown and unloved and the problem is they hate each other so they're never going to be working on it together but when they start receiving kind of leaflets and letters through the post sent by someone close by they see this garden that is their garden in all its glory years ago and Winston gets inspired to just start doing something with it he's quite lonely and isolated and he's breaking up with his partner he thinks but he's not sure and he just starts working on this garden and together those two neighbours form a friendship and that kind of grows from there and they start to build it up towards being a community space again but then you also see the story of the garden decades earlier when it was run by two best friends Maya and Alma and you watch as they create this space and make it a space for the community so it's very much about community spaces and connections and enduring friendship over years and obviously about gardens and gardening too oh that sounds so good you've hit two of my favorite things books and now gardens <laughs> <laughs> and is it, it's coming out in the uk very shortly right yes it is i think it's out in the u.s next april mm. so a little bit longer okay wow that's nice. exciting yeah. so was the editing process tricky for you? I mean, like, did you try to just do a lot of self editing and then eventually give it up to another editor? Yes. So I did a lot of editing before it went out on submission to publishers. And I felt at that point, I was happy with it. And that I love this book. And um, so then when my editor acquired it, and we started the editorial process, one of the reasons I went with my editor was because she had like, great ideas for it. And or everything she wanted from the book was what I wanted from the book and our editorial vision really closely aligned and I knew that I needed her to push me. Yeah, then unpicking that story when I kind of felt that it was done was really hard, but it was so worthwhile. But I realised that every single draft I do, I can't just do a small edit. I can't just like shave off a few lines here and there. I always just sort of like unpick it entirely and put it back together. So right until the very last minute before I went to copy edit, I was deleting huge scenes and mm -hmm. huge chapters, which I think was a bit of a risk. But I felt like I felt like I could I could do it because being an editor, I sort of felt like it was okay for me to do it. I'm not sure it was. And I don't know if my editor was panicked. And I'm just suddenly like, oh, I deleted these two chapters. Hope it's okay. Um, but anyway, I'm now really glad those chapters aren't in there. But yeah, it was a long process, I think. At first I start slowly, but then yeah, just every time get really stuck in and want to change everything about it. So the same happened with the second book. Again, every single draft, I changed an awful lot. Apart from one where I got really lazy and I 
changed nothing. My editor was like, you know, you haven't done any of this. <laughs> I know. It's because I tried to do it in a weekend. But anyway. <laughs> tried to sneak it in, but your editor caught yeah. you. <laughs> so, so if you don't mind um, us asking, what kind of editor are you? Or what types of editorial roles have you had? So I'm now full-time writing, which is really exciting. Congrats. But I most recently was editorial director at Hodder in the UK. So I focused on commercial fiction publishing. So I published everything from crime thrillers to women's fiction to uplifting fiction to sort of book group and reading group fiction. Before that, when I was writing the reading list, I was solely a crime editor um, working on the Harvel Secker list with authors like Ruth Ware and Yon Nesbo and Denise Minor. And I loved working on those books so much, but I also knew that I'd never be able to write a crime novel because while I can edit one, I'm not that good on like solving the crimes and like working out really tricky plots like that and I think the reading list was quite a good antidote from lots of murderous fiction that I was reading because it was just like something completely different so it was quite good for me having that separation I think from what I was writing and what I was working on. Oh that's so funny that gives a different spin on Chris the character in your novel who yes. writes crime thrillers yeah <laughs> in the little corner of the library <laughs> yeah I think I'm secretly Chris yeah. <laughs> do you read a lot of crime yeah I do I read everything really but crime I think was like my first love in many ways like I love fantasy fiction when I was growing up but my dad is a huge crime reader he loves books with murders in so I always read everything that he read and yeah, I just love crime. <laughs> That's great. So Sara, this has been so nice to talk with you. We could we could keep we could going keep on, going for but a long we time. respect your time. <laughs> we we loved one of the things we haven't talked about is the food in the novel is so amazing and really is a part of the story in a lot of ways. We're gonna celebrate this conversation today by going out to have a delicious Indian meal when we're done. But <laughs> There's one burning question that we have. What are spaghetti hoops? I do you not have spaghetti hoops in the US. No. <gasps> oh, well, they're like quite disgusting, but also delicious. <laughs> they're basically like you, they come in a tin and they're essentially like pasta hoops. Um, it's like quite thin hoops in like tomato sauce. Oh. And you have it on toast or something like that. That's what I used to have when I was a child. But it's yeah, it's they're like delicious but also incredibly bland but I don't know they're very tasty I think and it's a bit of a guilty pleasure for me I love I love that it's like if I'm feeling really lazy I just really want to get a tin of spaghetti hoops oh that's <laughs> we do we do have them here they're called spaghettios yeah oh yes yeah. Spaghettios, yeah. and you can get them with the meatballs or without meatballs <laughs> oh yes it's exactly that oh yeah. interesting okay. okay so do you eat it for breakfast or mostly as a you know lunch or dinner Maybe people eat it for breakfast, but I think it's a dinner thing for okay. me. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's so, I used to have them when I was a kid, and my friend Sharon and I would pretend that they were devil eyes for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> and we had to eat Ooh, them all. Getting back to you, the crime thrillers. Right. <laughs> that's a plot. <laughs> wow. Okay. So now I know what they are. Thank you. And the food it just was really a fun part of the novel. I enjoyed watching Mukesh grow and learn to cook in the novel as well. So thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I love the food. Every time I was writing it, I got quite hungry. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, we it's wish great. you really great success with the launch of the second novel and no pressure. Can't wait to see what else you're writing as well. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you so much. So for those of you who've been longtime listeners, you'll remember our Summer of Little Women when we read Little Women and some ancillary books. This summer, we are going to have something similar. We're going to start with the classic, and then we're going to be reading two contemporary novels and having biblio adventures as well. So everyone, welcome to Scarlet Summer. The first book we're going to read is in July... And it's The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Oh, I just heard everybody cheering. They're so excited. <laughs> Have you read The Scarlet Letter? I read it in high school. All right. So it's going to be a reread from me, but mm -hmm. from a long time ago. Yeah, same with me. I read it a long time ago when I was sick in bed with a fever. I really enjoyed it. Was it the fever? Was it the book? Time will tell. And then the other two books we're going to read are novels that have 
are thematically related to the Scarlet Letter. In August, we're going to be reading Hester by Lori Lico Albanese. And then in September, The Invisible Hour by Alice Hoffman. Additionally, we are going to have biblio adventures, going to Hawthorne's gravesite, his home, watching movies, All of that information is to come, but we wanted to let you know what our theme is so you can start getting your books in order, your reading summer figured out. (laughs) Yes. So again, uh, starting with the Scarlet Letter in July, we would love to have you join us for this. There are so many movie adaptations of the Scarlet Letter. It's not even funny from silent movies up until more recent many versions. I think some of our listeners might be familiar with the 1995 Demi Moore adaptation. So we are also going to have a Scarlet Summer bingo card for you to fill out if you're interested in participating. If you choose to do bingo and you're a winner. If you get bingo. Yeah, if you get bingo. It's been a while (laughs) since I've played bingo. Can you tell? If you get bingo, you'll be qualified to win a grand prize at the end of the summer. We should make little A's that they can put as their bingo thing. Oh, cute. We'll have to figure that out. We'll see. Or maybe you can make your own. (laughs) Get your red crayon out. (laughs) Yes, yes. We'll have... A thread started on Goodreads where you can add books that you think are related to the topic, Hawthorne, Witches, Salem, the time period, the other authors as well. Yeah, Alice Hoffman has a book called The Red Garden, which is not a prequel to The Invisible Hour, but a book that also takes place in the same town as The Invisible Hour. She also was very influenced by by the book, The Peabody Sisters by Megan Marshall. So we're going to have additional reading. We're going to have all sorts of things. We would love for you to pipe in and help us with that. We are going to be sending out an additional newsletter after this episode airs that's going to have a lot more details. So if you are not a newsletter subscriber yet, get yourself on the newsletter. This edition will go out on June 7th. Yes. With all these details. However, we will also be listing them in other places like in the show notes. Right. Yes. So welcome to Scarlet Summer, aka Book Cougar Summer School. You don't have to be bad to enter. (laughs) (laughs) So until next time, we wish you lots of happy happy reading. reading. Thanks for listening to the Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again with another episode in two weeks. Until then, come chat with us on social media, Goodreads, or email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. If you'd like to help support our podcast, please tell others about us, leave a review wherever you listen, and consider becoming a patron. Even a dollar a month is a big help. Learn more about that on our website, bookcougars.com, where you'll find the show notes for this and all of our past episodes. Thanks, everybody. This episode was edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.